Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, some think more competition for meat packers might be a good thing. In Southern Gardening, it's called Heritage Garden, an amazing connection to a bygone era. In the markets last week, we time traveled to DC for a WASD report. This week, we get the numbers for real. And in our feature, hemp versus marijuana, two competing economies. Farm Week starts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us once again here on Farm Week. The cost of food pushing the consumer price index and over the past several months, half the increase in the cost of eating is coming from higher prices for meat. As we've reported, Congress has pursued complaints about consolidation and price fixing in the beef industry. Recently, the USDA laid out more of its plan to level the playing field. Peter Tubbs has the story. But what I do know is that our job is to make sure that that farmer gets a fair price and that the producer, uh, that the gro when I go to the grocery store and I'm in the checkout line, I'm paying a fair price. I'm not paying more than I should. The White House and the USDA this week were decidedly more pointed in their initiative to address consolidation in the meat processing industry. Uh, I want to be very clear that the, um, the, the president's executive order directs the Department of Justice and the FTC to train their enforcement on potential illegal activities, including price fixing and price gouging. We're going to leave that to the enforcement agencies. Uh, um, that's their appropriate role. While the Department of Justice considers their next move where it pertains to the nation's four largest meat processing companies, the USDA will focus on increasing the number of meat processors in the country. I mean, I remember talking to a producer the other day in Council Bluffs, and he said, I don't get this. Mr. Secretary said, I just sold my cattle and I lost $150 a head, but the processor made $1,800 a head. How can that be? As part of President Biden's COVID-19 relief package, $500 million has been allocated towards support of new meat processors or those that are planning on expansion. The USDA also announced more stringent enforcement mechanisms through the Packers and Stockyards Act to limit meat packers' ability to use their market power to lower prices for market animals. The White House also hopes that by increasing the number of processing options available to meat producers, a larger share of the profits from meat production will find their way to the farm. No, I think the fact that we have put $500 million on the table and basically have begun a process of reaching out to states, uh, to farm organizations, to philanthropic organizations, and asking the question, what could you do with this resource that would allow us to significantly increase processing capacity in this country in places where we know there is a need for this, where there are not competitive markets, uh, and the reaction to this has been quite favorable. You just heard what Tom Vilsack said about producers losing money. I spoke to Mississippi cattle rancher Ted Parker on the phone. He said it's a complicated issue, but one thing is for sure, he's not making what he should. On cattle, he spends a lot of time raising. We're not getting a fair price for our cattle when the packers doing what, getting what they're getting. I agree that something needs to be done and it does make me really mad. It gives me a lot of heartburn to know that they're making that kind of money. But I think I understand markets enough to know it's just like me being a yearling man and buying, buying calves. And when I'm getting too many, you gotta take money away so you don't get so many, you know? And I'm not defending the factor, don't get me wrong. I, I, a long time ago, somebody told me that the factor's ancestors were buffalo hunters and Buffalo hunters, we know what they did. They killed them all, you know, and so the Packers, maybe they may do that to us. But I do not feel like we're getting a fair shake or the right percentage of money. I just don't know how to make it fair, and I just don't really think that a government mandate is the answer because there are going to be abuses in that, too, and they overdo things. And so it, it concerns me a lot. I think the only real viable answer is more jackal space. And 
that's going to take some time. Parker had one final thing to say. He told me, in his opinion, Packers collectively represent a monopoly. And he said in this country, monopolies are illegal. He also said we need more processing capacity, not less. And that, he hopes, will make producers, packers, and consumers happy. In other news, on the heels of Hurricane Ida, the ports in southern Louisiana trying to get back to normal, moving corn and soybeans down the Mississippi River. Those in the Grain Belt, like Mike Steenhook of the Soy Transportation Coalition, have been monitoring the situation closely. Steenhook had a lot to say about infrastructure. Well, the, the real big concern is when you've got a pretty seismic weather event in the Gulf of Mexico, right when our harvest season is coming online. So you've got all of this volume that soybean farmers and grain farmers are producing. You've got robust demand, particularly international. But then you've got this area of the country called the Lower Mississippi River that accounts for 61% of U.S. soybean exports, 58% of corn exports, by far the number one launching point for both commodities. And so all of a sudden, if you have a disruption at that area, supply and demand can't, can't connect, and they just look at each other, and the transaction will never occur. So that's the real concern, particularly as hurricane can see, season can certainly extend into the fall when our harvest comes online and our export program really elevates. So you look at the lower Mississippi River, which is number one, we've got 14 soybean and grain export facilities that are located along that stretch of the river from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, past New Orleans into the Gulf of Mexico. So unfortunately, that's also an area that's, that's, that's suspect for hurricane activity. So you can have these kind of disruptions. It is clearly that the profitability of farmers in the Midwest is so strongly linked to how functional our export capacity is on the lower Mississippi River. So it's very important for someone like me to be well acquainted with it. So even before the hurricane hit, uh, the big concerns that I had are, yes, the facilities themselves, the storage facilities, but it's the conveyance system that links the storage facilities that ultimately is used for loading an ocean vessel. That's the, that's the more fragile elements of these export facilities that are along the lower Mississippi River. And you think about it, it's not an accident that we've got all of these industries in the state of Iowa that flourish and exist in the first place because there's a group of farmers that plant a seed in the spring and they harvest it in the fall. And because the, that activity occurs, there's all these other industries like rural lending, manufacturing, seed technology, all of these industries that would not exist if it wasn't for the farmer. So that's all part of that story we need to tell that Yes, infrastructure is expensive, but the benefits exceed that, and that's why it merits our attention. And you're always only as strong as your weakest link, and so there are challenges with our rural road and bridge inventory, our inland waterway system, our ports. You know, I always try to keep in mind that if your supply chain, if, e if each link in your supply chain is made out of stainless steel, but only one of them is made out of a twisty tie, then you don't have an effective supply chain, even if most of the links are strong. So you have to be attentive to each of those links in the supply chain. So for us to do our job appropriately, we're gonna be very attentive to rural roads and bridges and the inland waterway system and our ports. And the, you know, the moment we focus disproportionately on one, then the danger is that one of those other links could become the twisty tie, and then you don't have an effective supply chain. On the lighter side in Southern Gardening, Gary Bachman in Vicksburg this week. There, he visits the Heritage Garden, listening to a unique voice about how gardening in the antebellum period was accomplished. Here's Gary. Today, Southern Gardening is visiting the Heritage Demonstration Garden in the Vicksburg National Military Park, and it's based on the typical Victoria-era kitchen gardens of the mid-19th century. The Heritage Demonstration Garden is a wonderful opportunity to get a glimpse into gardening of that era. Most interesting is the signage based on writings from the time period. We can learn firsthand the hardships and ingenuity the average family faced during the Civil War. The rustic summer house made of great vines and roots with beds of flowers all around was a great delight to me as was also a little vegetable garden where my brother Quincy and I planted our names in peas, lettuce, and radishes. 
I am more and pleased with my neighbor, Mrs. Willis. She sends me the finest lettuce I ever saw. She says it has been in the Vig family for 30 years. Mama is having quantities of peas, potatoes, and all things edible planted, as our only chance for anything from this time until the close of the war will be to raise it ourselves. Strict economy is to be the order of the day. Ginger is becoming a favorite garden plant in the southern states, growing luxuriantly. Scarcely a garden will be found ere many years that will not have its ginger bed. The Heritage Demonstration Garden is a joint project of the National Parks as Classrooms program and the Warren County Master Gardeners. When you visit the Heritage Demonstration Garden, there's lots of interpretive educational materials and modern QR resources. I'm MSU Extension Horticulture Specialist Gary Bachman, and I hope you'll join us next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break, but stick around. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, the reefer madness continues. The 2018 Farm Bill legalized hemp, but it and marijuana are the same plant, separated at birth by their buzz agent, THC. Now in a country where half the states have legalized pot to some degree, it and hemp are competing nose to nose in parallel markets. There's even a marijuana light. All this could change though, it's a murky mess. Coming up on Farm Week, don't go away. In Extension, we work hard to make sure that we're providing the best science-based education to our clients because we know that you need answers and solutions that you can rely on. It's natural to have questions, and it's important to be able to turn to experts that you can trust. I trust experts myself for the health of my family's cattle and crops, and for my health too. That's why I decided to get the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it was available to me. I want to protect myself, my family, and my neighbors from this devastating disease. And I want to get back to all of the happy times together that we have missed. So get the facts you need and get the vaccine. Let's all get back to the people we love and the activities we enjoy. Hi, I'm David Buys. And I'm Katie Buys. We know how important it is to take your health questions to experts you can trust. Who offer answers based on science. The science shows that the COVID vaccine is safe and effective at preventing the disease. Hundreds of millions of people have received the vaccine so far with very few side effects. But choosing to delay getting the vaccine increases the chance that COVID will spread. When it spreads, it mutates or develops variants. And we're seeing that variants can be even more dangerous than the original virus. Getting the vaccine is a personal decision. And when you choose to get it, you're protecting yourself, your family, and your neighbors. You're also protecting the most vulnerable people who can't take the vaccine. People being treated for cancer or organ transplants, people with serious illnesses, and small children. So get the answers you need. And get the vaccine. You'll, You'll be, be a, a hero. hero. Time now for the market segment. Zach Ashmore here with this month's supply and demand report. Here's Zach with his usual insight into those critical numbers. Thanks, Mike. All commodities down these past two weeks, except for lumber, slowly inching back up, but not too fast. The WASDE report dropped last Friday, and we'll look into its effects, but first, the numbers. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, wheat, down about 38 cents. We'll get into why in a moment. The short version, WASD effects in the prelude to a potential jump in prices. Last week's biggest gain, lumber, up nearly $60, still on the lower end of prices we've seen this year. Last year around this time, the price was 40 bucks higher. This month's WASDE report dropped last Friday, and as usual, markets reacted. Here's what it said. U.S. wheat supplies lower while food use raised 2 million bushels. Exports unchanged while ending stocks lowest in eight years. Projected 2021 and 22 season average farm price lowered to $6.60. Global wheat supplies up on higher production in Australia, India, and China. World consumption raised 3 million tons, mostly for feed and residual use. Projected ending stocks increased 4.2 million tons. U.S. corn beginning stocks up 70 million bushels with reductions in corn used for ethanol and exports. Corn production for 2021 and 22 up 246 million from last month. 
Global corn production forecast higher relative to last month with increases for China and Argentina. Corn imports raised for Canada and Mexico and reduced for Vietnam. U.S. rice supplies reduced, mostly on smaller production. Average all rice yield up 79 pounds per acre. Total domestic and residual use lowered. Season average farm price raised to $14.80. Global rice supplies raised 9.5 million tons. India's production raised to 122 million tons, its second largest crop on record. Global consumption lowered 2.2 million tons while trade raised 0.9 million tons. U.S. soybean production up 35 million bushels with a yield forecast of 50.6 bushels per acre. Harvested area down 0.3 million acres. Soybean crush reduced 25 million bushels. Global soybeans show higher beginning stocks for China and higher U.S. ending stocks, accounting for a global 2021 and 22 soybean ending stocks increase. Raised 2.7 million tons to 98.9 million. U.S. meat production lower, beef production down due to lower slaughter and lighter weights, broiler and egg production raised, turkey production reduced. U.S. dairy production reduced from last month on smaller cow numbers and less milk per cow. Butter, cheese, and nonfat dry milk price forecasts raised on improving demand and lower production. U.S. cotton beginning stocks slightly lower than last month, but higher production means higher ending stocks. Exports 500,000 bales higher. Season average farm price for upland cotton, 84 cents. Global cotton ending stocks 540,000 bales lower this month due to higher consumption. Global production higher but trade down slightly at 46.8 million bushels. So as you saw, markets down in response to the WASD, but experts say that shouldn't last long. Market analyst John Roach gives us the trader side and also tosses in some advice for the row crop farmer. Uh, that we had uh, some bigger numbers than what people were anticipating. Uh, not substantially bigger, but just a little bit bigger numbers. And again, it's a market that's, that rolled over and was in a hard downward slide. Uh, and um, uh, and so when the, the numbers were released, we continued to wash on further, uh, but then bounced. And um, uh, the numbers really didn't vary all that much. Uh, and uh, we think that wheat market is getting itself positioned for a move higher as we move on through the, uh, the rest of the season. We're just beginning corn harvest, and we ended the, the season, this last season, with a relatively tight supply of corn in the bin. So now we're starting into the field, and I can tell you farmers don't like this price. So farmers will deliver the grain that they have sold, and some farmers may be selling some grain out of the field at these kind of price levels, but not very many, in my opinion, and not for a while yet. Uh, we're just barely getting started, and I think the buyer is going to be more nervous in here uh, than what the seller is, and so I think that these prices could well be the low for the season. If not, we can, we can spend some time here, rally back up and move around a bit, and then maybe we come back one more time and put the real low in. It's too hard, to, it's too hard to, to look that far into the future. Right now, I can just look into the immediate future, and in the immediate future, the buyer is not going to be able to buy very much corn next week. Uh, farmers will be in the field, but there's not going to be much for sale, and I think the buyers get nervous. At, uh, at this uh, point in time, uh, we're down on a buy signal. So uh, the people we're talking to are the people who did make the sales at the higher price levels back through the, uh, the uh, part of the year. Uh, we're buying those bushels back. So my suggestion to a farmer who's made heavy sales, uh, who's, who's not quite happy, uh, they'd like to own, they'd like to, to, to have some of those bushels back, go get them. Uh, that would be my suggestion. If you want to, if you want these any bushels back, go get them, uh, and uh, and you hold on to them until we see what's going on down in South America, uh, and uh, uh, and and we anticipate that we'll have some price improvement as we move through the fall and we worry about their crop. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Past few weeks we've seen a small downturn, but I've got a feeling things will bounce back. Mike, thank you, Zach. Now a subject that's attracted a lot of attention, legalizing marijuana. The states work through that. Farmers can legally grow hemp in all 50 states. One report shows CBD, made from hemp, generated sales of $5 billion in 2020. Even with that pot at the end of the rainbow, hemp growers without a plan are struggling. Josh Bittner has that story. Nearly a decade after Colorado breached the green wall of cannabis prohibition, over half of the U.S. has administered some degree of legalization, decriminalization, or medical use for marijuana at the state level. 
The 2018 Farm Bill permitted nationwide commercial cultivation of weed's industrial cousin, hemp. A gold rush crashed that nascent market, and now a controversial method to mitigate the glut is pitting hemp against recreational pot. We started selling Delta 8 THC, and that was a huge source of our income. I'm not sure where the hemp industry would be if we didn't have Delta 8 right now, just because there was a mass oversupply and not enough demand. Jake and Ashley Bainbridge farm, own, and operate Botanicana, a hemp store in Galena, Illinois, a state where legal marijuana sales began just last year. In 2019, so many farmers jumped into it. There was just, there's still excess material biomass from 2019. So, you know, being able to turn all that biomass into Delta 8 really helped out the hemp industry as a whole, for sure. While touted as a potential food, fiber, and fuel alternative, the big winner of hemp's market infancy was cannabidiol oil, or CBD, sold as a health panacea in myriad value-added products. Hemp and marijuana are the same plant, cannabis sativa, but diverged legally by amount of THC. Scientific authorities report natural Delta-8 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, is a rare substance in the hemp plant around one-tenth of one percent. Proponents say it's more cost-effective for mass production to synthesize the molecule from raw CBD surplus in a lab process known as isomerization. Marijuana is high in Delta-9 THC. We carry Delta-8 THC derived from hemp. The Farm Bill states that hemp is defined as anything under 0.3% Delta-9. So um, basically all the CBD stores started realizing that we could just carry Delta-8. It's not in the law. It's a lot less expensive than the recreational marijuana is. You know, we're able to produce it a lot, lot cheaper. Cheaper than indoor grows. On a chemical level, Delta-8 is an isomer of Delta-9 and has been described as marijuana light, less potent minus side effects like anxiety and increased appetite, with a lower price tag. You save big time. This is a full gram cart for $40. Um, if you were to go to a recreational marijuana dispensary, you get a half gram cart for $70 plus 40% tax. Um, our tax is just 8.25. In light of murky messaging from the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration about its legal status, some weed legal and illegal states have moved to ban Delta-8, citing health and fraud concerns. I think what it is is we don't have the high taxes, so the state's not getting their revenue from legalization, and uh, the dispensaries are not happy as well, just because all these hemp stores are selling THC. According to the National Institutes of Health, THC and CBD are two of over 100 identified naturally occurring compounds, known as cannabinoids, found in hemp and marijuana. In all, some 540 chemical substances are reported present but research has been hampered by federal restriction. Legislating against specific cannabinoids is just the wrong approach in general. Chris Berry is chief operating officer of the Illinois Hemp Growers Association. He says patchwork measures from state to state and different municipalities confuse consumers and law enforcement, and it's high time for the federal government to step up with blanket approval to untangle the mess. You know, food purity laws and, and all this other stuff are already out there to regulate these products. Um, we're creating this separate framework and treating it like it's not its not just another consumer product. The, there already are organizations, institutions, regulatory bodies that literally monitor and check every single item that you could potentially put into your body. People running for president of the United States readily admit that they've used marijuana. Last month, Senate Democrats backed a bill to strike down long-standing federal prohibition and allow all cannabis to be taxed and regulated. This is monumental. Though states could long... still outlaw its use. Just west of Illinois, Iowa remains tenacious on prohibiting all forms of THC. But 2020 was the first year hemp was grown there legally since the World War II era. If I was told that I could make Delta 8 out of this, we'd hit the ground running. Despite market saturation, Hawkeye State growers like Colby Gardner are pressing on in year two. A processing bill didn't make it through the state legislature until mid-season last year, becoming effective this past March. Gardner hauled his first harvest to Michigan and contracted with hotels elsewhere to produce hemp-based toiletries. He plans to begin processing on his own and says vertical integration is the key to success. I think that's the difference maker. If I simply run out here and grew plants, I could break even, but it's a lot more profitable to value add 
and to, then to control those processes and understand the formulations. That's similar to the approach taken by the Bainbridges, who, though recently denied approval to sell recreational marijuana amidst Illinois' COVID-delayed controversial second wave license lottery, continue to expand market share. They plan to apply again later this year for marijuana approval. In the meantime, Jake has ventures in other legal states. The couple also opened a second store in nearby Dubuque, Iowa, but only CBD is welcome there, not Delta 8. Not in Iowa. Iowa, I believe, is probably going to be one of the last states to legalize, unfortunately. Whether states and the federal government ultimately button up or end prohibition, the next iteration of the Farm Bill could close the cannabinoid loophole. But those on the front lines agree hemp and marijuana are here to stay. And certainly there are a lot of folks hoping to get into both industries, depending on the political climate. Well, next time on Farm Week, a virus success story. It struck fear into humans for generations. Now it looks less like this and more like this, rabies. Used to be we worried more about our pets. Now rabies is more likely to come from wildlife and it can still be fatal. So experts fly the country, dropping thousands of special vaccine packets from Maine to Alabama. Winning the war on rabies, that's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv and don't forget to follow us on YouTube. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.